Hi, welcome back to another episode of Theology Applied. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. And in this particular episode, I'm very privileged to welcome onto the show for the first time someone that, even though it's our first time discussing these things together, I have from a distance, as many of you listening have, been immensely blessed by his public preaching and writing and ministry. So without further ado, let's welcome our guest, Pastor Vodi Bauckham. Mercy Meadows Ranch is a family-owned and operated cattle company producing top-quality beef in Central Texas. Mercy Meadows Ranch serves families across the nation by supplying beef that is hormone, antibiotic, and vaccine-free. They ship bulk beef nationwide because they want to enable families to take control over a major portion of their food supply. Their vision is to help create a Christian-based parallel economy and community to become your trusted beef supplier in support of a multi-generational family heritage. And because of their bulk beef deposit launch taking place this summer, they are hosting a giveaway to stuff your family's freezer with their grass-fed, grain-finished, beef-raised right on their ranch. Now, to enter the giveaway... Go to the link in the description and enter your email and you'll be all set. Mercy Meadows Ranch. Check out their website, mercymeadowsranch.com. With the banking industry in another tailspin and the Fed ready to raise interest rates once again, many of you are probably asking, when does this madness stop? If you're interested in learning how to establish a family banking system outside of today's mainstream banking insanity, then schedule a call with our sponsors at Private Family Banking. There's a way for individuals and families to put their hard-earned money to work continuously accruing compounding interest and have those resources available as collateral for cash or for financing investments, business college, and other major life expenditures without going to the big banks for loans. Income tax protected, safety from stock market losses, guaranteed rates of compounding interest, and the ability to store up an inheritance for your children's children and avoid the death tax on your estate. If this interests you, then email our friends at familybankingnow at gmail.com to schedule a call. Again, that's familybankingnow at gmail.com. Send them an email today. Applying God's Word to every aspect of life. This is Theology Applied. Welcome back to another episode of Theology Applied. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. And in this particular episode, I'm very privileged to have, for the first time, Vodi Bauckham. Vodi, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's good to be with you. Would you just take a moment, uh, probably most of our listeners are very aware of your ministry and who you are, but would you just take a moment and introduce yourself and what, what you've been doing and what you're currently doing for the kingdom of God? Wow, yeah. I um, have been a pastor, church planter uh, for a while, and uh, eight years ago, um, in fact, it'll be eight years in August, um, the Lord called us away from uh, the church that we had planted. We had planted a church planting church in uh, the greater Houston area, North Houston, up in spring. And uh, God called us away from there to come to Lusaka, Zambia, to help start the African Christian University here in Lusaka. Um, partnering with the Reformed Baptist Churches of Zambia. And so for the last, um, again, almost eight years, that's where we've been. That's what I've been about. Um, I'm back in the U.S. three or four times a year to do short preaching tours. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we're here. We've, we've been here. We decided to come for three to five years. Um, it, it's now three plus five. So I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. But um, we're here until the Lord says otherwise. Praise God. Um, Yeah, I have been blessed from a distance watching your ministry, reading uh, some of the books that you've written. And, you know, I recently said in one of my podcasts and maybe even one of my sermons, I I am post-millennial in my eschatology. um, But uh, that doesn't mean that uh, God exalts nations and he decimates them when they're faithless to him. And so uh, within my eschatology, you know, it could be 5,000, 50,000 years before Jesus returns. I, we, we don't know. It could be five years, but uh, 
there's no promise that America will endure. So I, I've been encouraging Christians to fight for our nation, but also save up for their grandkids' uh, Zambia fund. Yeah. So go ahead and move over there with you in case, yeah. in case America becomes unlivable. So. Yeah, yeah. No, it's interesting. I always, All right. I always tell people, you know, go ahead, I, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm millennial in, in my eschatology, but I tell people, you know, I live post mill wherever I am. Um, so, uh, you yeah. know, I, I, I get you, you know, I, I'm, I call myself optimistic Amil, you know. Right. So. Amen. Yeah. A lot of my friends are optimistic Amil and they're, and they're trying to live faithfully, uh, like, you know, in their daily lives, like a post mill. And the thing that surprised me, surprises me is that actually, um, some of the guys who are like the most ferocious fighters, um, not saying it's just a cultural war, but it's both. It, it is a spiritual war. But here's what I always tell people. It, it's a spiritual war, but between who, right? It, I mean, God, yeah. Satan. Um, but here's the thing. God cares about the world, not just the 17th dimension and the ethereal plane. Like he cares about the world. Satan cares about the world. Democrats care about the world. It seems as though the only entity I'm aware of that doesn't care about the physical, tangible world is evangelicals. That said... Um, I think some dispy pre-mill kind of guys, uh, even though I would disagree with their eschatology, some of those guys are the most faithful fighters um, in the culture war, not at the expense of recognizing it is first and foremost a spiritual war, but spiritual wars have cultural implications. They have tangible implications. And, and so to say, uh, we're, we're going to try to hit it at the head, go to the root, um, but but it's it's both and it's not either or. Do you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean I agree wholeheartedly. And um, you know, living in Zambia for the last um, seven almost eight years has really just sort of reinforced that for me. Um, you know, coming here and living here has helped me to really see and appreciate the fruit that the gospel has borne in the United States, and it is an incredible blessing. Um, to live in and to have been born in and, and raised in um, and inculcated in uh, a society that has um, so much residue from its Christian right. heritage that we really take for granted. Right. Yeah, from the Christian heritage. I, he I heard you with Tom Askell uh, recently saying that, you know, the, the Zambians, uh, you know, the Christians in our nation, we envy their preamble a distinctly Christian preamble, um, but that they actually envy our heritage yeah. and that the heritage, the preamble matters, right? Why, why not both? Let's have both if we, if we can. Let's work towards both. But, uh, but that the heritage um, has stronger implications in, in the here and now. Could you, could you flesh that out a little bit? What, what, what do you see as the heritage of America? Yeah, it, it just, I've often said that if you want to know Everything that you need to know about a culture, just experience a four-way stop, um, and 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 you'll see <laughs> what's really ingrained in the culture. Um, whether people are stopping, waiting their turn, being courteous, or whether the only law is the law of physics, and whether or not I can get my bumper in front of yours. And right. you know, it's interesting. You know, in the United States, you can you know be on the road, middle of the night, and, you know, at a red light, you stop. Um, that, that's, that's part of our heritage, you know, right. and living in parts of the world where, you know, that, that's just not, that's just not the thing. Um, and again, that's just a, that's just a, a small example. There are many, many more, uh, but that's just one really sort of tangible example. Another one is, you know, I live in a city, I live in the capital city here in Lusaka. And most people walk here in Lusaka, uh, but there are almost no sidewalks. Um, mm. in, in the U.S., very few people are walking where they're going, uh, but we have sidewalks everywhere. And right. that, that's part of our heritage, right? That, that's, that's part of our heritage in terms of not just infrastructure either, uh, but in terms of value of life, protection of life, um, you know, there, there, are, there are little things like that all over the place that just remind me of that long rooted heritage and, and culture. Amen. 
Yeah, I think part of the problem, this is one of my suspicions, but I think part of the problem is as America drifted the American church in terms of its doctrine and false gospels like the prosperity gospel, sometimes there's an overreaction. Um, and, and I think at some level in our defense and shoring up the true gospel of Jesus Christ against particularly the, the false gospel of prosperity, uh, we, we almost threw out the baby with the bathwater in regards to a simple biblical principle, in my assessment, which is that obedience brings blessing. And yeah. not just blessing, it guarantees blessing in the life to come. Yeah. But ordinarily, and I'll give that qualifier, ordinarily, ordinarily, obedience brings blessing in this life as well. And that's, that's not the prosperity. What I always tell people is the prosperity gospel is the equivalent of me teaching my children that, that when they turn 18, every single Friday, they should stop at the same liquor store and buy a lottery ticket and play the same numbers. And if they do it faithfully long enough, eventually they'll be rich, right? Yeah. It's the prosperity gospel is the power of positivity. It's manifesting. It's, it's about faith and our faith. It's hopeful. It's wishing. That's very different than, than the basic biblical principle of hard work ordinarily is fruitful. Now, there are some contexts that break the mold. There's always exceptions. There's some faithful Christians in North Korea yeah. that aren't seeing a lot of fruit. But that's why I say ordinarily. But in a country like America, the Christian can expect uh, that, that obedience would produce a certain measure of, of blessing, not just in the life to come, uh, but even in this life as well. And so we look at whether it's the four-way stop and we're courteous, you know, and waiting our turn with a right of way, or whether it's, you know, the, the sidewalks and the things that you've mentioned, um, seeing these as tangible physical blessings in this world, in this life, but they're directly correlated to obedience to the Word of God, where the Word of God is received and honored and esteemed and obeyed, uh, not just by individuals, but in societies at large, we should expect there to be tangible blessings. But I think we've just become so spiritual. Everything's spiritual that yeah. will reject the prosperity gospel. And we kind of threw out in rejecting the prosperity gospel, throwing out the, the bath, uh, baby with the bathwater with that very biblical principle, obedience brings blessing. God is sovereign over the ends as well as the means, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so with my children, um, God is sovereign over the salvation of my children, but the sovereign God has already also given me means. He's given me very clear right. instructions about bringing up my children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Um, you know, ab about me, you know, washing them and my wife with the water of the word. Um, you know, again, the ends and the means. The other thing is that you say, you know, that obedience should bring blessing, but the fact of the matter is that obedience has brought blessing. If That's you right. look at a globe and you ask yourself, where are the freest, most prosperous, right? You know, safest people in the world. Where are women mm -hmm. most protected? Where are women safest? Where do they have most protection and most rights in the world? The answer is follow the Protestant Reformation, right? Mm -hmm. where, where are the lowest corruption rates in the world? Everybody's got some corruption, right? But where are the lowest corruption rates? The answer is follow the Protestant Reformation. Even in Europe, mm -hmm. um, Northern Europe versus Southern Europe, there's a huge difference. Protestant Reformation. Western Europe versus right. Eastern Europe. Protestant Reformation. Um, and so, yeah, there, there not only should be, but there is blessing. And I think it's not only ironic, but sad that we refuse to acknowledge that. And in fact, if, if you think about it, the people who are, uh, you know, complaining the most, for example, you know, where are women protesting the most about, you know, not having rights and not having protections in those parts of the world where they have it more than anybody else? You know, I live in a part of the world where not too far from here, female genital mutilation is the norm, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and child brides and, and selling brides. Uh, you know, that, that, that's a real thing, not too far from where I am. Um, so I, you know, I, 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 again, I think you're right. I would just add that caveat. Not only should it bring blessing, but it has. 
Well, that's great. I love your caveat because I was trying to go real reasonable, play the good cop. I'll let you do the bad, bloody <laughs> bad cop. Because uh, I was trying to be real reasonable and say, yeah. you know, it could, obedience might, can we yeah. at least consider it might bring blessing? And I love that you said, no, 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 no. It yeah. does bring blessing because I, I agree. So I, I see in many ways, it feels like um, you and I would both agree neutrality is a myth. Um, the myth of neutrality, uh, that, that all laws are moral, um, that, that, and I, I'm not saying you're necessarily comfortable with this word, but I would, I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I would see that, uh, for every individual, for every family, for every, um, for every nation that is in the civil realm, every government that, that it is theocratic, uh, which for the record that scares people, a theocracy is very distinct from an ecclesiocracy. I'm, I've never advocated for a church run state. I'm not advocating for a Protestant Pope, um, but I do think that, that the reality is that theocracy, not ecclesiocracy, separation of church and state, but no separation of Christ and state. Caesar is under God. Caesar is a servant. He's a deacon. He is not head of himself. So every single entity, both the family, the church, and the state, it's not excluded from this principle. There is a God above them. And, and it's not whether but which. It is a theocracy. It's either a theocracy that, that ultimately is underneath in submission to the triune God as God, or it's demos, the people, or the state. It's statism, totalitarianism, all these different things, or it's pagan, some pagan God. And so with all that being said, it, it seems like we've switched gods in the West, um, and, and you could argue at the time, you know, 50 years ago, 130 years ago, you could go back to the enlightenment, you know, or, or whatever, but we've switched gods and it seems like, you know, this, this, these ships move slowly, um, because of the principle of sowing, you know, uh, sowing and reaping, um, and, and, and God's faithfulness, he will not be mocked. And so you sow, you sow good seed, you're going to reap a harvest uh, for a while after you stop sowing. And so these ships, Christendom and, and I think paganism, they, they, they have been kind of slowly passing in the night. And it seems like there was not just a couple of weeks or months or years, but decades in our nation where the two ships were kind of like, like side by side. They had lined up for a moment. And it was, it was seemingly, because they moved slow, a long moment that gave the optic that, that neutrality is viable, uh, that it actually works, but it doesn't. And, and I'm of the persuasion that secularism is not viable. Uh, that it's actually a placeholder. It functions as as not a host, but but a parasite. Once it's killed its host, namely Christendom, that, that secularism will actually only be replaced by some form of paganism. And, and it seems as though that's been ramping up. And a lot of young guys like me are seeing that because we haven't lived the majority of our lives in, in you know, our adult lives. My adult life was not in, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. Um, I was, I was a little kid born in the eighties. And so a lot of my adult life, what I've seen is, is classical liberalism, uh, and, and some of our, our systems utterly failing. And so I, I don't have a, a strong dog in the fight of like, we got to get back to that. I'm so there's a lot of young guys right now who are like, let's be Christian. Let's be a Christian nation. And, and let's bring that into the civil realm. What, what would you say to young guys like me? Where, where are we? Is there too much zeal? Is is there? What, what, are we on track? What what are we what are we doing right? What are we maybe doing wrong? Yeah, I, I think there are a couple of issues at play, and one of those issues is um, kind of a, a, a theological nearsightedness, you know, a theological um, ignorance, and I think for a long time you, you think about the the church growth movement all the way from the Jesus movement, right in, in the sixties and seventies. Um, this sort of big revivalist movement and, you know, church is growing and then the church growth movement, um, y you know, I'm 54. Um, I, I came to faith, you know, at 18. Um, and so I saw a lot of that stuff, right? And there was this sense in which, you know, if you just pull the right levers, um, the church would grow. And, you know, and then the, the religious right, right, comes along. Mm -hmm. And again, if we just use our influence, um, you know, if we just have the right people in the right place, then we can get the people that we need in the places that we need. Um, and, 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 you know, and we can make things happen because, again, we're this big, powerful uh, behemoth um, with, with wow. churches that have thousands of people. And in the midst of that, uh, what we weren't doing was thinking. 
what we weren't doing was theology. We became extremely pragmatic during that time. And so we've got a couple of generations now of people who have been raised in pragmatic Christianity, who haven't been thinking, who weren't mentored or discipled by people who thought very much um, other than, you know, pragmatism. And now when this generation uh, hits a crisis, um, all we've got is knee-jerk reactions. We've got nothing that's well thought out. And so that's why you see sort of shouting matches from people going off half cocked um, who are using terminologies and promoting ideologies uh, with which they've only become familiar recently. Um, mm. And, and, and I, mean, I think that's what we're seeing right now. Right. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that that's absolutely true. Um, it's tough with the pragmatism thing. It's tough for me um, because I, d I don't want to be pragmatic. I, I see the drawbacks with that. But one of the, the debates that I've been in but lately with some of my Baptist brothers is, uh, well, it's, it's got to be bottom up. If, if there is going to be revival or reformation, if there is going to be, you know, uh, a stop, if we're going to put a stop to drag queen story hour, um, sexual mutilation of children, uh, 65 million plus babies murdered in their mother's wombs. It's got to be, it's got to be bottom up through the preaching of the gospel, regenerate hearts. Um, we need more Christians. And yet I, I feel like it's, it's never less than that. So my argument is never an alternative to that. I'm a local pastor. First and foremost, I preach the gospel. Um, so it's never less than that. That's the tip of the spear. But in addition to that, I feel like, and now you can make an argument that in the 70s and the 80s and even the 50s and 60s, that, uh, that, that our numbers were skewed, that we were bolstering in, in typical Southern Baptist fashion, you know, a lot more on the roster than there actually are in the pew, uh, that the numbers were skewed and that we had a lot of people attending church and professing Christ, but they weren't actually regenerate. And so you can say, because um, what I'm about to say is I think we've had the numbers and it, and it still failed. That's, that's kind of what you just said. And then I know some of my brothers would say, but we didn't really have the true numbers and, and w because there wasn't solid, faithful gospel preaching that actually converts the soul. And, and I see all of that. This is my one, my one pushback to, to, to not even what you said, but to, to some of my brothers is the Sodomites took 3%, less than 3% of the population. And with a 40 to 50 year plan, they have effectively replaced the flag of the United States of America with a rainbow. And my point in saying that is that um, it's never less than bottom up gospel preaching, regeneration, new hearts. And yet at the same time, um, there are Christians now who actually as individual Christians, not just churches talking about politics, individual Christian men serving as civil magistrates. And, and they're wanting to know, how, how can I be a city council member Christianly? Does the Bible say something to me in my vocation? Or is it just the sphere of home and church? And if the Bible does, like, am I supposed to be a Christian in every realm of life? But when I walk into this sphere, the public sphere, that I take that Christian hat off, that, that I lay it aside, I adopt neutral terms, um, and... Or can I say, yeah, it's got to be bottom up, preach, regeneration, salvation, discipleship, and at the same time that we can ethically and even must, commanded by God ethically, to pull some of these state levers um, in a Christian direction. What do you think? Um, I'm always skeptical whenever somebody says to me, it has to be dot, dot, dot. Um, yeah. that, that, that's not the God I serve, right? Um, sometimes the king finds the word of God and, and revival breaks out, right? Um, that's right. So, yeah, I, I'm never comfortable when someone says it has to be um, this or it has to be that. Um, I, I think I think the answer is all of the above. I think the answer is faithfulness wherever we find ourselves, right? That has to be, right. that has to be the answer, you know, faithfulness wherever we find ourselves. 
Amen. So talk to me about fault lines. You, you wrote the book. I read the book, me and everybody in the whole world. It seems like, I mean, it was, it was a popular book. Was it, a, was it a bestseller? Yeah, Did it yeah, make it any was. bestselling lists? Yeah, it did. It yeah, was, it did. Congratulations. Yeah. Well yeah, done. You, you, you earned it. Thank it was you. a great book. It was, it just, you, and you, before writing the book, you've been doing this, you know, through preaching and teaching and conferences, um, the ethnic Gnosticism. Did you, you coined that, right? Yeah. That term? Yeah. yeah. So, and all the way back, I think, and, and correct me if I'm not giving you enough credit, but it's as early as 2012, you were kind of sounding some of these lo- alarms. Maybe yeah. Before, really sure earlier before. than that, you know? Um, okay. Yeah. Really, really earlier than that. <laughs> well um, done. So, I mean, you, you saw these things long before I did, you know, and I'd, I, I'd like to give myself a little bit of an excuse and say that you were seeing things when I was still in high school. Yeah. You know? So maybe, <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe I, you know, providentially I was born a little bit too late, but, uh, yeah, you, you've done an excellent job. Fault lines was so helpful putting words to certain things. Cause, cause everybody, I mean, there's so many Christians in the pews. They're just like, what is going on? Why, why, why are two men that I, that I respect and I've respect for years, all of a sudden at each other's throats and, and drifting apart. And now I think people have made sense of it, right? 2017, 18, 19. So in 2018, just for context, so I was an Acts 29 pastor. Uh, we left, um, I pulled the church out in 2018, right after Eric Mason wrote woke church. Mm -hmm. And so, um, when that happened, I pulled our, our church out of Acts 29. I spent all of 2019 with my elders and leaders in the church saying, um, I'm tired of doing uh, theology a la carte. I don't want to just be a Calvinistic Baptist. Praise God, bless bless them. But I'd like to be a confessionally reformed Baptist. So we spend a year, every single week, hours uh, working through the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. We were able to adopt that at the end. I was pastoring in Southern California, 2020 hit. So this is right before March 2020. Things go crazy. Uh, we have some disagreements on how to respond to COVID. Um, I, I'm i saying, let's open the church. There's some other guys saying, open the church. There's some other guys saying, let's not. Um, the Lord works through that. Eventually, you know, th- things are good. We opened, let the record state, we opened um, a, a good six weeks before MacArthur made it cool. And so now, <laughs> granted, it's easier it's easier yeah. to open a 150-person church, yeah. you know, than yeah. a, yeah. a 10,000-person church. You know, but, uh, but we did open before MacArthur. Yeah. And then... Uh, and then at the end, um, I, I'm from Texas. My wife's parents moved to Texas. Her sisters and husbands and kids moved to Texas. My parents are in Texas. And, and 2020 really made me miss Texas. And, uh, yeah. and so we, we ended up leaving. Me, me too. The church over <laughs> to, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we handed the church over to faithful, faithful guys, and the church is doing well. Uh, but, but we left and, and planted, you know, doing a new work here in Georgetown, Texas, just north of Austin, Texas. And, uh, Far enough for the police not to be defunded and close enough for people to commute to work. And so, we, you know, we're doing a, a work here. But my point in saying all that is that um, fault lines uh, was, you know, you know, I was seeing some of these things 2017, 18, really saw them 2020. Your book makes sense of it, you know, gave, gave some extra clarity and hindsight. And for a lot of other evangelicals and realizing, you know, Russell Moore, God bless him. He's not on my team. He's not on our team. Uh, David French is not on our team. Um, Francis Collins is not on our team. Um, and, and so boom, I feel like we kind of with wokeness, with, with, uh, positions on the state and tyranny and, and the branch Covidians and all the, you know, whatever you want to call it, we, we lost about <laughs> half the team. It, it feels like, it does feel but like now, it, yeah. but now it's like, are we about to lose? Are, are we about to, is the, is the team going to split again? Because it's like the first set of fault lines was over who sees the problem. And it seems as though there may be some new fault lines shaping up over who sees the solution. Unite us, buddy. <laughs> help us not, help us not <laughs> divide. What, what do you think? Yeah, um, division is necessary. Um, division is absolutely necessary. Division brings clarity, and ultimately, it brings real unity. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, the the people who divided. Um, over all of these things um, weren't uh, with us um, wholeheartedly one day and then turned into different people the next. Uh, yeah. these, these crises revealed um, underlying ideologies and commitments um, that, that had always been there on both sides, you know, um, it, right. it, it, it revealed every man things. has an allegiance. Yeah, absolutely. 
And, you know, the, the, but here was the issue. There, there were always disagreements, right? Um, even in, you know, sort of these broader reformed circles, um, whether you call it young restless reformed, new Calvinism, you know, whatever you want to call it, these circles that were really sort of growing and percolating, you know, during that time that brought about the sort of Acts 29s and the T4Gs right. and the gospel coalitions and all of these sorts of things. We, everybody um, knew that there were divisions, that there was a lack of agreement, right? We had our Presbyterians and our Baptists and, you know, our dispensationalists and, and, and Reformed and, you know, we had all of that and everybody acknowledged that we had those differences, yet there was something greater that was, that was holding us uh, together, right? And so I, I don't think that, you know, with the Black Lives Matter movement, and with, you know, COVID and all this, that somehow, you know, people changed. I think mm -hmm. the stakes changed. I think that these movements actually, you know, drew a line in the sand, right? They, they, they drew fault lines right. and they were non-negotiables. They were more non-negotiable than pedo baptism Credo baptism, That's right? right. Um, so it, it's not that we didn't have disagreements before. It's that these things came about and these things became non-negotiables. And the culture made them non-negotiables, right? The culture is the one that said, you know, if you're, if you're wrong on this issue, racial justice as defined by the culture, um, you're outside the camp and there is no you know, going along to get along. There is no neutrality right. on this issue, right? Baptism, you know, we can disagree on and go our own ways, but this issue of, you know, so-called racial justice, um, that's something where you, you disqualify yourself. Um, so right. th th that, that's what we saw. That's what happened. And then all of a sudden, now we're seeing, you know, the other shoe that dropped. And, and I remember, right? I'm in, I'm in the middle of, you know, being entrenched, you know, fault lines and all the attacks that are coming because of fault lines and, you know, pe people, you know, using means legitimate and illegitimate, you know, to try to, to try to discredit fault lines. And all of a sudden, you know, I felt like there was real traction. I felt like there were a lot of people who were saying, yes, amen. And thank you. Right. And then there was more boldness in, 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 in what was in, in the side of the argument that had been forced into silence, right? Mm -hmm. There was more boldness in that side of the argument. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, you almost get whiplash because people start going, yeah, well, you're worried about CRT, but what about this white Christian nationalism? <laughs> what, like what? Mm -hmm. Like, wait, wait a minute. What? <laughs> you know, right. um, and, and they start, you know, citing books by people who are barely in the camp, if at all. Um, right. you, you, you know, um, and, and I think a, a lot of us at that point were going, okay, first of all, um, define your terms, you know, like, right. like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Um, define your terms. You're saying like, like, uh, like, don't just talk past each other on Twitter. Maybe take the time to write like a, a statement on your terms of Christian nationalism, defining what you mean. Like, yeah. if someone did that, for instance, just hypothetically, just hypothetically, you know. <laughs> just hypothetically, <laughs> you know. And the, but the great thing about statements, you know, because again, in two thousand and and um, you know, man, COVID just messed up the calendar. I think it was in, in the social justice statement. Yeah, eighteen was that? Was it eighteen or nineteen? I think it was eighteen or nineteen. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, and, you know, when we came out, I signed with, it proudly. Yeah. When we came out with that, that, that statement, you know, on, uh, social justice and the gospel, you know, the great thing about that was that it was a way for people to be identified, right? Right. It was a way for people to say yay or nay. And, and that's what, that's what statements and confessions and things like that do, right? Um, they, they, they get, a, they get rid of the squishiness, you know, 
Um, and, and, you know, sometimes people will say, um, yes, but, and they have a legitimate, you know, grief. And they'll say this, you know, technical issue right here, you know, blah, 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 the way you worded that or the way, you know, whatever. Right. And, and, and that's fine. That's great because that helps the people who write the statement to sort of massage it, you know, if necessary. Um, but what we experienced was people just going, um, no. And we're going, right. okay, why? Where? Uh, just no. It's not wrong. Um, it's, it's just, pastorally unwise and insensitive right it's not it's not what the statement says yeah it's what it does yes it, <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah 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 yeah. tim keller tim keller yeah yeah it's that's not what right. it, it's not what it that's says right. it's what it does yeah that that was that was a that was classic right there um but my, my point <laughs> but you know my point is that at first you know the people who were using the term uh, christian nationalism and it was white christian nationalism um because again, for the neo-Marxist and for the intersectional, um, you know, uh, people, um, you know, you use all three of those terms because the demonic, hegemonic, uh, oppressive power in the United States um, is, you know, white, male, heterosexual, cisgendered, native-born, you know, able-bodied, um, you know, on down to, and then you get to, you know, Christian, right? Christianity is, right. is, is at the root of the hegemonic power. So when you say, and that's what they hate. Yes. That's you, what they hate. Everything exactly, else exactly. is just an angle towards exactly. That. Exactly. It's all about, they yes, hate Christ. Yes. So when you say white Christian nationalism, you get an intersectional boogeyman. Right. And so that's right. the, the, the lack of clarity was coming from the people who were using that terminology. So when I say define your terms, you know, I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean? I, I might be, I might be right there with you. You know, I, I might agree that it's, you know, CRT is a problem and this thing, whatever you're, you know, defining is a problem. And then I go and read, you know, some of the books. Um, you know, what is it? Codes de Mez, for example. Um, and, you know, Jesus and John Wayne, which is one that everybody was touting and, and pointing to. Right. And I'm going, this is not even in the camp, you know? Right. Th- th- this is this is out of bounds, not even yes. in the camp, you know, and this is what we're what we're using and what we're touting for, you know. So I, I think now we're seeing um, a response on the other end where where people are saying, OK, fine, if you want to throw that terminology around um, and not define it or define it poorly. Um, you know, the other one, the, the really popular one was. Um, what was it? Was taking America back for God? I forget the authors of, of that one, but that one had a I, lot I know of traction. What you're about. I, I can't remember, but yeah. yeah, but that one had a lot of traction as well, um, and, and, and at least you know made more of an effort to really define Christian nationalism. But the way they defined it, it included Jews and you know black people were included as white Christian nationalists, and you know all this other sort of stuff. Uh, yeah. um, so it's now people on the other side going, okay, fine. He, here's where. Here's where we stand. Here's what we, you know, understand in all of this. Um, but again, it's, it's part of, it's part of this same battle. It's just the next front in this, in this same so. battle. And we have to clarify it. I think theology, theology sharpens over time and it sharpens with sharp disputes, yes. and disagreements. In fact, in the providence of God, he often raises up heretics just so that the church will go back to the drawing board and shore up their theology on the hypostatic union or short, you know, and, and we forget that it's like, yes, there was a strength undoubtedly I'm confessing. There's a strength to church history, but we forget that it, that it took about 400 years to figure out who God is, you know, and, and, and to figure out is the, you know, the, the dual nature of Christ as the second member of the Trinity. And, and the way I see the big picture, and it's part of this is my post-millennialism talking, but I, you know, the first thousand years, it's like theology proper, doctrine of God. The next thousand years, soteriology, right? That's a big one. Let's, let's figure the, dial that in with the Reformation and figure out how are people saved. I, I have a sneaking suspicion right here on the beginning of this third millennium um, since, since Christ and, and his earthly ministry, I think Christian ethics is going to be a big one. I don't know if it'll be the one, but I think, you know, who is God? Um, who is man and how is he saved? Soteriology. 
but in Christian ethics. And I, and I think the civil magistrate is going to be a big part of that and our understanding of um, how do these things play out? How does this apply? How does, you know, go ahead. It seems like you were going to say something. Yeah, and I'm, I'm saying even in, in all of those things, it was never new, right? There, right. Were, there right. were always people who were right on all of those things. Um, but, but, right. but the time, you know, it took time to sort of separate the wheat and the chaff. And it's the same here. There are people who've been writing and thinking um, rightly on these issues mm-hmm. for a long, long time. And interestingly enough, what people are having to do is to go back to some of those people who were writing and thinking rightly on these issues, right. you know, in, in, in order to sort of, um, you know, backfill and and, and move forward. Um, and it, it's it, like you said, it's a good thing because it sharpens. It, it's absolutely right. necessary. But here's the problem. The problem is, like I said before, what the culture has done is uh, it has emasculated us. Okay. W- when we talk about sharp disagreement and you know, sharp disagreement being used to sharpen us, right? Uh, that's very masculine. Um, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. That's very masculine. And our effeminate culture hates masculinity. Right. And because of that, they it hates sharp divisive. disagreement. Bad. And so sharp disagreement is no longer allowed. It's just disqualification. It's cancel culture, right? That's right. You're not saying the right thing on this. Therefore, you are disqualified, you are wicked, you are excommunicated. Right. Yep. And, and sometimes you can do it just with uh, the method and, and not even have to yeah. engage the message. Right. Yeah. You can say that, um, well, I don't like your tone. I don't like that, uh, that, you know, there are guys on your side using, uh, using memes, you know, or, and so you're being harsh or you're being, or you might even say, you know, I don't like the font, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, it's not what, it's not what it says. It's what it does. (laughs) Right. Exactly. You know, I, I'm over here just saying, I long for the day voting when a statement will be judged by the character of its content and not the color of its font. You know what I mean? That's, that's where I am. I, <laughs> no, all that being said, I think that was a bad idea. We, yeah. we changed the font. But but yeah, but engaging the argument and not just dismissing, um, not just, and, and both sides can do it and say yeah. like, well, well um, you're, you know, because there's the Theo bro group and a lot of them are on my side of the issue. And uh, and so it can just be like, well, you're effeminate, right? Because, uh, because we've been, uh, we're not complementarians anymore, Vody. I don't know if you've kept up with this, but uh, we've been patriarchal for about 15 minutes, right? We came into that doctrine, you know, myself included. And because we, we've held firmly to this doctrine for the last 15 minutes, you know, we'll dismiss anybody as being effeminate, you know, yeah. if they, if they yeah. don't agree. So we can do that. And then on the other side of the aisle, it can be very much, uh, this is harsh or, or this is uh, whatever. And then, and then neither one actually has to engage theological substance. So if we right. can get there, what, you're, is, what I hear you saying is, uh, no, we don't need a false, trite, shallow sense of unity we need the the true unity that comes providentially by god's grace through division iron sharpening iron but but the problem is we can't even get (laughs) not only can we not get to the true unity we can't get to the true unity because we can't even get to the true division right now we, we, we still see squabbling over um tone method um we need to i'd like to see some real division over arguments over substance and and that goes for both sides yeah. Um, by the way, like, we, but we really need to engage, um, make me an argument, uh, from the Bible, give me Bible, uh, for why Christian culture is a net negative. I understand Christian culture in a societal at large way, uh, can produce or at least, um, influence nominal Christianity, nominal seminaries, nominal doctrine, nominal preaching, uh, to the point where the gospel is assumed, eventually neglected, eventually utterly lost, uh, to produce less conversion. Now, but wait a second, you're making me that argument. Do you catechize your kids? Did you take them out of public school and put them in a Christian school or homeschool? So in, in the sphere of your individual family, 
you're treating Christian culture not as though it's salvific, because no mm -hmm. one's saying that, mm -hmm. but you are treating it as though it is good, that the law of God has an evangelistic sense. No man will be saved by works as done unto the law, but it is a tutor. And the law, insofar as it accurately reflects God's holiness, it therefore reveals man's sinfulness and drives us to Christ as the only one who can fill that infinite chasm. Um, yeah, but the, you're but, doing that in your home. Yeah. Can we do that in a country? Can we do that in a country? But think about what I said before with, you know, the, the Jesus movement and the church growth movement and all these other things. There was an anti-intellectualism and an anti-confessionalism. And mm -hmm. because of that, you know, talking about the law, talking about the threefold division of the law, talking about the three uses of the law. This is this is foreign to right. an entire generation. Right. And so, you know, you're already talking about something that's two, three steps ahead of where people are ready to. Yeah. Of, of where people are, are ready to engage. So, again, there's a lot of backfilling. Um, that yeah. that needs that needs to be done, and um, well, anyway, you know, by God's grace, you're man. absolutely right. Well, th this has been so helpful for me. I know it'll be helpful for our listeners. Pretty much everybody who follows me, um, just you know, is is watching my stuff whenever you don't have content for them to watch. Um, so, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, so I know that everybody will be excited about this episode, Ooh. getting to, to uh, watch you. Any final thoughts that you, you have for us or anything that you want to plug with your ministry, things that, that people can pray for or follow yeah. or pay attention to? Yeah. I mean, just this, this new curriculum piece that we have out, this fault lines curriculum piece. I mean, I think it's, I think it's an important tool. Um, there are some people who've read the book for whom this will be helpful in, you know, sort of going deeper into that message. Um, some people who haven't, uh, for whom this will be an, uh, a helpful introduction. Um, we're, we're looking at things from, you know, sort of different view and different perspective. Um, and I think it will also be helpful for engaging in this kind of sharpening that you were talking about. You know, sometimes having somebody else, um, who's the lightning rod, uh, helps, you know, helps right. to, helps to soften the blow. And so, you know, our hope is that people will get a hold of this and that they'll use it and that it'll be helpful. And, um, if nothing else, um, furthering, you know, those iron sharpening iron kind of discussions around uh, some of these issues. Amen. Where, where can people find that? Um, they can find it on, at Salem now. Um, okay. Yeah. Salem now, salemnow.com, salemnow.org. Um, okay. I don't know which one. And I'm pretty sure is, you guys have an yeah. app too. You can go to the app store yeah. and, and download Salem now. Yeah. Great. And selfishly, I'll just plug my little thing too, that uh, if anybody is wondering, there's, sure, there's a bunch of different, there's, there's a wide spectrum of people who'd have different views of what Christian nationalism yeah. is. But anybody who wants to know my team, and I'm not putting voting on our team, we'll wait, let him read the statement. He'll sign it, but we'll, we'll give him time. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but for those who are on my team, guys, guys like William Wolf, you know, uh, guys like Dusty Devers, our statement, if you want to read it, it's Christian, uh, it's a statement on Christian nationalism .com, statement on Christian nationalism .com. Um, And our goal is, uh, is not to make a name for ourselves. Our goal is that you could actually understand what our position is. So that we can see, I've got a sneaking suspicion that there might be less disagreement than we think there is. And and perhaps we could get on the same team. And if not, at least we can actually uh, engage the substance. And and uh, and that's what we need. We need iron sharpening iron. Well, Vodi, sure. thank you so much for your time, your graciousness, your willingness to come on the show. I know you're a busy man. And uh, we hope to have you on the show sometime again in the future. Thank you, brother. It's been great. Thank you for the work that you've been doing. It's uh, really encouraging. And I appreciate it. Thank you. God bless, and thank you guys for uh, tuning into this episode, and we'll see you again with Theology Applied next week. We've been privileged by Vodibaka Ministries to be given a piece of their content to share with all of you. Vodi has a new teaching series fleshing out the ideas that he popularized in his book, Fault Lines. So if you've read the book, but you want further discussion, further explanation and biblical teaching on that issue, the things that are dividing us today, not only in the culture at large, but even within the church, then you've got to check out their new series, Fault Lines with Vodi Bakken Ministries, and here is a video that they've given us permission to share with you. It's the introduction to this new teaching series. Enjoy. I, I wrote Fault Lines because of my love for the church. 
we're doing this project because of love for the church. I honestly believe that the critical social justice movement represents a threat, an existential threat. Not a threat to Christianity per se, because Christianity can't be threatened. God is on his throne, he will protect his bride. However, it represents a threat to unity within the body. We gotta act like that the disadvantages between us are cultural and are not systemic, then we can't be together. Critical race theorists want to deliver us from the basement low ambitions of a thin, emaciated view of equality. It represents a threat to the clarity of the message that we communicate. Whiteness becomes the standard by which all good theology is judged. Whiteness is rooted in plunder, in theft, in slavery, genocide of Native Americans, sitting on stolen land. So that if it's right theology, it's written by a white scholar who is contextualizing that theology for white audiences. Uh, the gospel will always be the gospel. However, we are not always faithful in the way that we communicate the gospel. Because silence is too high price to pay to be unified when our necks are under a police knee. The anti-racists fundamentally reject savior theology. That goes right in line with racist ideas and racist theology. And we're not always faithful in the way that we apply the gospel. When you sign up for this congregation, you're signing up to be part of racial justice. And if that's not for you, then this church is not for you. The solution is fundamentally, yes, the gospel, the cross, the resurrection, but also dethroning white supremacy in all of the forms in which it shows up in Christian spaces. So the goal here is to fight for faithfulness, to fight for the truth of that gospel, to fight for the Bride of Christ, to fight for unity in the Bride of Christ. It's a breakthrough if you can get white people to acknowledge that our race privileges us in this society. That is like the second coming. Virtually no white man thinks they are guilty. You have to push and push and push to the point where, hey, wait a minute, I think you're, I think you're pushing, pushing an agenda. Well, you're finally listening. My psychosocial development was inculcated in the water of white supremacy. I have grown up with this invisible kind of bag of privilege. Like, I am a racist. Mm -hmm. A system in which whiteness and white people are central and seen as inherently superior than to people of color. I'm going to struggle with racism and white supremacy until the day I die and get my glorified body. What I'm talking about right now is white privilege. Because I'm immersed in a culture where I, I benefit from racism all the time. Nothing makes Anglos more angry than the idea of white privilege. The Bible is very clear about the issue of justice. What does the Lord require of you to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? We know this from Micah 6, 8. And so justice is not optional for the people of God. That's why it's so critical that we understand what justice is. One of the dangers of the social justice movement is that it uses terminology that on the surface sounds like it ought to be what we as Christians are about. Social justice. Am I against justice? Of course not, I'm for justice. Anti-racism, am I pro-racism? Of course not. So what we need to do is get behind these terms, get behind these words and look at two things. Number one, look at what people mean when they use them in this cultural moment. And number two, evaluate that in light of what the Bible says about the same issues. So for example, when we talk about justice from a biblical perspective, justice means the righteous application, the impartial application of the law of God in a given, given circumstance. Uh, we're told that we're not to be impartial to the poor or to the rich. We have to apply God's law equally across the board. 
social justice means something very different. And so if we're going to have conversations about justice, if we're going to have conversations about contemporary issues of our day, we're going to have to do so in light of what the Word of God has to teach about all of these issues and while evaluating the cultural moment. You know, I've come a long way on a lot of these issues. Um, I am a guy who uh, had as probably the biggest hero of my life, um, Malcolm X. Uh, I am a guy who was always um, very Afrocentric, um, very, you could say, social justice oriented. As a believer, um, I came to a crossroads and I recognized that for the most part, I identified a lot more with my blackness than I did with my Christianity. For the most part, it was much more important to me that I was black than it was that I was Christian. Over time, I had to come to grips with the fact that in Christ, at the foot of the cross, there is no male or female, there is no Jew or Greek, slave or free. Over time, I had to come to grips with the fact that Christ died not only to reconcile us vertically to the Father, but to reconcile us horizontally with one another, and that I am a member of the body of Christ, and that nothing supersedes that. Nothing is more important than that. And it is that realization and my desire to see that unity manifested within the body of Christ. If you're doing this study with a group, my hope is that this would be a place where you can be open, where you can be honest, a place where you can evaluate the narratives that are flying all around you, and a place where you can judge those things, not according to your feelings, but according to the truth of the scriptures, according to what thus saith the Lord. I do believe that justice is incredibly important, but justice is only important to the degree that it is the justice that God demands. To that end, we have to be right about what the word justice means and about what God requires of his people in this critical moment. 